There it is. Okay. Last week we looked at, we left Israel uh, in oppression, enslavement, in the land of Goshen, in Egypt. And today we're going to kind of pick up there and we're going to look at not yet precisely God's plan of deliverance, but at his deliverer, uh, the man that you know as Moses. So we're going to generally be looking at Exodus 2 through 6, um, about five chapters of the book of Exodus. Now Moses, basically from the time he was born, was stuck between two worlds. He was torn between two different worlds. See, the Pharaoh, for fear that the Israelites would continue to grow and that they might overtake his regime in Egypt, he commanded that all of the, first, all of the males born to the Israelites would be thrown into the Nile River and drowned. Now, Moses was born to his mother, and instead of throwing him into the Nile, because who does that, she hides him. And she hid Moses for three months until she felt like, and you know how babies are, right? They just get louder and louder. And so she hid him for three months until she just thought that she couldn't hide him anymore and then devised this plan. See, one day there was uh, a daughter of Pharaoh bathing in the Nile River. And Moses' mother took and made, well, in the Hebrew, they, she made an ark. But she made a, a little boat out of reeds and pitch. And she put Moses into this little boat and put Moses out among the reeds in the Nile so that the daughter of Pharaoh, the princess, would see it. And, and so she did. And so she sees, sees Moses. She sends her servant to go get the baby. And she decides that she wants to raise this child in Pharaoh's home. And at just that time, the older sister of Moses comes into play. She comes to the daughter of Pharaoh and she says, hey, if you're going to take care of this baby, you're going to need a Hebrew, a Hebrew woman to be able to nurse the child. And Egyptians and Hebrews didn't really mix. So that sounded like a good idea. So she said, I'll go find you one. So she went and she got Moses' actual mother and brought her to the princess and she chose her to raise this Hebrew child that she found. So in a sense, at least for the first couple years of Moses' life, he was raised by his own mother, although he was raised in the house of Pharaoh. He was taught, caught between two worlds. He was nursed by his own mother, but he didn't live among his own people. He learned the Hebrew language, presumably. He seems to converse casually with the Hebrew people. And yet, where he laid his head and where he shared meals, he had to speak the Egyptian tongue. Moses was, from the beginning, torn from two worlds. A as he grows, he starts to see this for himself. One day, there was an Egyptian slave master beating one of the Hebrew men. And it angered Moses that, that he would treat his own kinsmen in such a way, and he went and he struck the Egyptian slave master and killed him. So he took the body and he went and he buried the body in the sand. And I don't know, it seems that maybe Moses thought that he'd gotten away with it. But he didn't. Some time passes, and he goes out another day, and there's two Hebrew men. And they're upset with one another, and they're fighting. And Moses goes to them, and he, and he tries to sell, settle their dispute. And he says, brothers, why are you fighting? And they turn to him, and they said, who made you prince and judge over us? Do you mean to kill us as you did the Egyptian? And Moses knew that he had been found out, that he'd been caught in his sin. And it wasn't only that. Because soon Pharaoh knew. And even Pharaoh then sought to kill Moses. Now there's an irony in this passage. 
Who made you prince and judge over us? See, at this point in the story, Moses, he's not a great guy. We don't know a lot about him. We know he's a Hebrew who was raised as an Egyptian, and we know he's a murderer. We know he cares for his own people, but he doesn't live among his people. We see that he's caught and divided between two different worlds. He's nobody that you would choose as prince, and he's no one that you would choose as judge. And what's interesting about it is he's already, in a sense, a prince in Egypt. That's why the movie is called Prince of Egypt. He's already, in a sense, a prince of Egypt, and yet he will soon become like a prince of his own people. He's no one of power or authority over the Hebrews. But soon, in Moses' life, he will be chosen not just as a deliverer, but as a leader and even a judge over God's people. So this is a foreshadowing in the story that we can see. That even through the broken man Moses, the immature man Moses, the sinful man Moses, that God is choosing a deliverer. He's going to craft him and mold him and shape him after his own image. So that, again, this arrogant murderer will one day write the book of Deuteronomy that concludes that Moses was the humblest man who ever lived. And I'm going to guess Moses didn't write those words. Not that part. So the Pharaoh wants to have Moses' head. And so Moses flees to a neighboring country um, where the Midianites live. And this is interesting because, again, the Midianites are a pagan people. And so he goes there and he, uh, he has an exchange with the daughters of their, the high priest of the Midianite temple. And we've been down this road before where God's people mix with pagan nations. And so Moses uh, takes a uh, wife from the daughters of the Midianite priests, whose name was Jethro. Uh, and so he takes a wife, her name is Zipporah, and he marries her, and they have kids together. And again, Moses finds himself torn between two worlds. One who knows that he is a Hebrew, and that he is to worship the one true God, and yet, as we'll see in the story as, as, as we move forward, one who isn't even circumcised according to the covenant of Abraham, and one who would gladly take a, priest, a priestess of pagan gods as a wife. Again, he's torn between two worlds. Now, it's here in Midian where God takes this very broken and backwards and mixed up man named Moses, and he calls him to do incredible things. That God takes this busted up dude and starts to mold him and shape him into a great deliverer for his people. The famous burning bush scene, Exodus 3. Moses is, in, is, is out in the wilderness or in the desert and he sees a bush that appears to be on fire, although it isn't being consumed. And within the fire, in the bush, there's a man and yet the man is himself on fire. And the man speaks to Moses from within the bush. And yet Moses learns that, that this man that speaks to him from within the bu bush is Yahweh, the God of Israel. And Yahweh says to Moses that he will deliver the Israelites out of Egypt. That he's going to, to do that work, and he tells Moses that he's going to do it through him. And, and Moses reiterate, I'm sorry, Yahweh reiterates to Moses the very covenant that he had made with Abraham and with Isaac and Jacob before him. That he would take them to the land of Canaan, that he would give them the land that is flowing with milk and with honey. Moses is skeptical, as I think you or I would be. Why, why would God choose me? And who is going to listen to me? This is Moses' concern. And so, so Moses is given gifts by Pharaoh. And I don't mean gifts like a box full of money. I mean giftedness. He's empowered to perform signs and wonders. Uh, did I say by Pharaoh? By Yahweh. Thank you. This can, sermon's going to be interactive. Speak up if you like. Um, 
I was just checking to see if you were paying attention. Um, yeah, he's given, he's, given, he's given the ability to perform signs. He, Yahweh tells him, hey, stick your hand in your cloak and pull it out. So he does. And he pulls it out, and it's covered in white scales, um, which is a sign of leprosy, which is a deadly disease in the ancient world. And so that must have been terrifying for a brief moment until Yahweh says, now stick it back in your cloak. And he does, and when he pulls it out, it's normal again. He tells him, throw your staff on the ground. He throws his staff on, his gr- on the ground, and it turns into a great serpent. And Yahweh says, now grab it by the tail. So he grabs it by the tail, and it turns back into a staff. And he tells him, go get a pitcher of water from the Nile River. So he does. And he says, now pour it on the ground. And he pours it on the ground, and this is a foreshadowing of the plagues, that he pours it on the ground, and it turns to blood before them. And so Moses goes, and he performs these signs before even his own people to see if they will believe him. And once he does that, then he goes to speak to Pharaoh. Now, when Moses goes to speak to Pharaoh, he performs these signs before him in order to demonstrate to Pharaoh that that Yahweh is supreme, that he is the great God. And he tells Pharaoh that Yahweh has called them to go out into the wilderness for three days and to worship him there. And Pharaoh looks at Moses in anger. And he sees Moses is lazy and he thinks that they're just trying to get out of the work that he's called him to do. And Pharaoh becomes bitter against Moses and he refuses to let the Israelites go to worship Yahweh in the wilderness. And he's so angry that he increases the labor of the Israelites to the point that they can't even accomplish their work. And they begin to beat and oppress them more and more and more because because of Moses. And so the Israelites became bitter towards Moses. And they wanted wanted Moses to just leave them alone. The Israelites were more comfortable in their slavery in Egypt than in the discomfort of deliverance. But God consoled Moses in Exodus 6. And this is really going to be the focus for the rest of the message. When we look at Exodus 6, we're going to see that God reiterates his promise to Moses. His promise that was given to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. And he does so specifically to to assure Moses that regardless of Moses' own weakness, and regardless of the disbelief of the Israelites, and regardless of the bitterness and the refusal to listen of Pharaoh, that God is bigger than them. That he's bigger than the situation, and he's still at work. Look at Exodus 6, verses 6 through 8. Say therefore, this is Yahweh speaking to Moses, say therefore to the people of Israel, I am Yahweh. And I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am Yahweh your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am Yahweh. The people wouldn't listen to Moses because they were broken from slavery and harsh treatment. And yet God is certain that he will indeed rescue his people. And in like fashion, the way that I like to read the Bible, I read a story like this. And I think, what is the significance of this story within the grand narrative of all of Scripture? You see, it's important to know the story of Scripture, and many people have tried to kind of create a synopsis of the story of the entire Bible. How do you, how do, you do that? 66 books from some 40-some-odd 40, 40 off authors and countless editors and prophets who, who contributed to different parts of the, of, of, the, of the work that brought it to the, to the condition and the place that we have it today where we have, we have kind of just one anthology that we can sit and we can read, and, and sometimes it doesn't read like one story. You get... 
you get to the end of Genesis, and it makes sense right as it flows into Exodus, but then you get into other books, and they don't seem to flow, and they don't seem to have the same narrative. And what do you do with that? And so people have tried to synthesize it down and say, how do, how, what, if I could just say it in one sentence, what is the Bible about? And I think the, the most common phrase I've ever heard is uh, that the Bible is God's redempted plan for man or for humankind. And, like, that's kind of true, but I don't know that it's his plan. I, I would say rather that if you're going to go with that route, that it's better to say that the Bible is the story of God redeeming his people. The story of God redeeming his people. But then I start to think that that doesn't encapsulate really the fullness of everything that the Bible is about. And so I'd like to, like to think rather than one sentence about what the Bible is. What, how would you explain the Bible in a few paragraphs or in like five minutes? If you could explain it in that way. And I think what I see in the scriptures is something a little bit different. I see a people of God. And it's a people of God, much like Israel within Egypt. It's a people of God who are, who are often oppressed at times and, and, and who, are, who are often persecuted, in this case enslaved. And, and it's a people who aren't in every way focused on following their God, who is Yahweh. And it's a story of, of how the God who created all things enters into history and works to redeem those people and to bring them back to him. And it's interesting because if you start to use broader terms like that, the book of Exodus starts to sound a whole lot like the New Testament. Jesus was born when there was a charge in the Roman Empire that every firstborn, or not every firstborn, every male born should be killed. He had heard that one was supposed to arise who would be king of the Jews, and, 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 and Caesar was king, not any Jew. And so Mary and Joseph, not long after Jesus was born, they fled to Egypt. And Jesus lived the first handful of years of his life in Egypt. And it's really interesting because Hosea, the prophet of the Old Testament, in Hosea 11.1, 1, he wrote, Out of Egypt I called my son. And Hosea was talking about Israel in the Exodus. Hosea was reflecting on God's covenant love for his chosen people, Israel, his, his first son, Israel. That's what, that's, what, that's what Hosea is thinking about. He's reflecting back on the narrative of the Exodus, the very text that we're reading today. But in the book of Matthew, Matthew quotes Hosea as he thinks about Jesus. And he says, out of Israel, I called my son. And he quotes Hosea to say that Jesus is the one who comes out of Egypt in order to save God's people. Out of Egypt, I have called my son. And you can easily create parallels. And they, well, they could go on and on. Jesus performs miracles. And his miracles are not necessarily miracles for miracle's sake. They're not, he doesn't heal for healing's sake. He's actually performing signs and wonders so that the people of God would know that he is the chosen one of God to deliver, to deliver them out of Rome. Well, I didn't say out of Rome. To deliver them out of this world. Moses, likewise, was, was given signs and wonders. Not so much for Pharaoh, but to convince his own people that he was the one chosen by God to be their deliverer, to take them out of Egypt. Jesus is the deliverer of God's people in the New Testament. Moses is the deliverer in the Old Testament. And, and yet even these are somewhat superficial connections to make. 
somewhat superficial connections to make. I want to go back to Exodus 6, 6 through 8, because there's some parallels specifically in this text that run very deep. And so I'm going to kind of read a part of that text, and then I want to reflect on the New Testament. So I am Yahweh, Yahweh says through Moses, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. In Matthew 11, 28, 30, Jesus said this. He said, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lonely in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You see, in Egypt, Yahweh didn't want to free the Israelites from Egyptian oppression so that they would be free in every sense of the word free. He didn't want to free them into anarchism. No, he actually, he actually wanted to free them into submission to Yahweh as king. The nation of Israel is what we call a theocratic nation. It's a nation where God is king and he rules over his people. And so he, he was inviting them out of Egypt... And yes, through a time in the wilderness, through a time of hardship, because change is always hard. But he was inviting them into the land that flows with milk and honey, into a land of blessing where they would receive the blessings of their God forever. And that's what Jesus is saying here. He, he's using the same terminology. All of you who labor and are heavy laden, weren't the Egyptians laboring and carrying great burdens, weren't they heavy laden? Weren't they in need of rest? Weren't they being worked seven days a week, 52 weeks a year, or however many weeks they had in those days? He said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. You see, you see to, to give yourself over to Jesus as Lord, to give yourself over to Jesus as master is take, to take off the yoke and the burden of this world. But it is to put on the yoke of Christ, the yoke that is easy. And in that we find rest, not always for our bodies. That's not what Jesus says. It's not his concern. But he says, rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And it's hard to do that. Even the Egyptians under this great oppression in Egypt were fearful to listen to Moses. The, the idea of rebelling against Pharaoh and entering into the wilderness was so much harder that they hardened their hearts against Moses. They didn't want to follow him. They became resentful and bitter against him. Moses goes on in chapter 6. He says, I will deliver you from slavery to them. And, and, and this whole idea of slavery in Egypt is used prolifically throughout the Old Testament and into the New Testament. And it's, it, and it, it's used to illustrate sinfulness. And I think nobody says it better than Jesus in John 8, 34. When he said, truly, truly, I say to you, Everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. You see, the Egyptians could go back to work every day. They can go collecting straw and making bricks and building the cities of Pharaoh. And in everything they do, all they're doing is demonstrating that they are slaves to Pharaoh. The Israel. I'm so sorry I'm doing this. I think it's the sunlight. I was sitting here worshiping with you guys earlier. I got a splitting headache, and I'm so trying to focus right now. Come read my notes for me. Um, Truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The Israelites can go about building the cities of Pharaoh, and they only prove themselves to be slaves to Pharaoh. And when Jesus looks at that narrative... He sees precisely this, that you may claim the name of Jesus and you may believe that your sins are covered by the blood of Jesus, 
But when you practice sin, when what you do with your lives is to walk through immorality, things that don't honor God, and you live in that, then Jesus says that all you do is prove that you're a slave to sin. And Jesus doesn't, didn't, didn't die so you remain a slave to sin. He said, come to me, all of you who labor and are heavy laden, and, find, and I will give you rest. He said to, to cast off the yoke of slavery to sin, to come to him. He's gentle, he's lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. His yoke is easy. And his burden is light. And sometimes we look at the wilderness before us and we think that, think that the change that has to take place is so difficult that we'd rather remain in our sin than walk through a process of repentance. And I'm not going to pretend that it's easy. I've had to sit with people and listen to stories that are unfathomable stories of being involved in the death of other people stories of betrayal and adultery people who got away with horrible things and wanted to know how to get things right it was a lot of years ago now probably 15 16 years ago now i went with a guy to the sheriff's station to give a confession. It's not easy. The wilderness lays before you. But on the other side of the wilderness is the promised land. Jesus' yoke is easy and his burden is light. And we don't remain in sin and unrepentance because in that, all that we do is prove that we belong to this world and not to the kingdom of God. And it's in this light. I will deliver you from slavery. Yahweh says, I will redeem you. In fact, in Acts 7.35, Stephen is telling the story of the Exodus, and he says that Moses is the redeemer of Israel. He actually calls Moses the redeemer, um, which is a term that we start to use for Jesus in the rest of the New Testament. We call Jesus the Redeemer. And and it's really interesting because as we reflect on this idea of redemption through through the narrative of Israel in the land of Egypt, um, it takes on a whole new meaning. You see, we, we tend to use the word redemption as a synonym for salvation, right? Almost like the New Testament uses a whole bunch of different words to say the same thing. They all just mean we're saved. That means we're going to heaven or we're, we're, we're the people of God or something like that, right? But it's not actually. See, salvation is tied to God's wrath. So, salvation has to do with rescue from punishment. It ha- and, and, but redemption is something different. Redemption is when you are not where you're supposed to be and somebody brings you to where you, b- you belong. Redemption is when you're a lost child and you are adopted. Redemption is when you are Israel in the land of Goshen and God takes you into the promised land. Redemption is when you are the church of God living in the kingdom of this world and Jesus comes back a second time and he rescues his church and brings us into the new creation. Redemption is is when you're walking through life as a sinful human being and you're living life the way the world lives. All I'm trying to do is get the best I can for me and mine. And you're walking through your life with the mentality of the rest of the world around you and God takes you and he gives you a new heart and a new mind. He makes you a new creation and you start to live life now not for your own selfish interests but for the benefit of the kingdom of God and the people of God. Redemption is deliverance. It's receiving. Salvation is focused on the wrath. Redemption is focused on the promise. Salvation is about what you don't get, the condemnation. Redemption is about what you do get, the perfect and eternal kingdom of God. And so Moses is the redeemer. 
He's the one who comes to rescue Israel. Sure, to save them from oppression, but how much more to deliver them, to redeem them, and to bring them into the promised land. And that's why in Galatians 4, 4, and 5, the Apostle Paul adopts this redemption language that's used for Moses. And he says that when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, that's Jesus, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. It's because you and I were once estranged from God. We were rebels against God. But Christ has died and rose and ascended to the right hand of the Father and been enthroned in the kingdom of heaven so that you and I can no longer be estranged but to be sons. Be thou my vision, we just sing. Thou my true Father, I thy true Son. That it's no longer about this family in this world, but it's about God's family in God's world. He goes on, he says, with an outstretched arm great, and with great acts of judgment, I will take you to be my people. This idea of an outstretched arm, or sometimes it's just arm, is, is a reference to the power of a king, the power of a sovereign. And one of the powers of a sovereign is the, is the power, the authority, the right to be judge. And I love what Mary, Jesus' mother, does with this in Luke 1. When she finds out that she is pregnant with the Messiah of Israel, the Savior of Israel, she sings this song, and look at a couple of the lyrics. She's saying, he has shown strength with his arm, with his power, with his judgment. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones. Even as the Messiah, the Savior of Israel, was growing in her womb, she was able to see into the future the logical conclusion of what that meant. That the kingdoms of this world will fall and that the, kingdoms of, the kingdom of God would rise. And she rejoiced in that. She gave praise for that. She saw not just the judgment of the world, but she saw the deliverance of God's people and the beauty of the eternal kingdom of God. And so Yahweh said, I will take you to be my people and I will be your God and you shall know that I am Yahweh, your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. This is a common motif. It starts in the book of Genesis. Nearly these exact words show up all throughout the Old Testament and into the New I will be your God, and you shall be my people. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God. And it's really interesting because depending on what church you go to, and what tradition, and what time in history you, you live, you tend to get an emphasis on one of two things. In one tradition, you'll be told that Christianity is about God's love for humankind. And it is, right? And then in another church tradition, you'll be told that Christianity is about God receiving glory from humankind. One of them is about, I will be your God, and one of them is about, you will be my people. Right? To say that, that, that Christianity is about people giving glory to God is emphasizing God's headship, his sovereignty, his godhood. But when you say that Christianity is about God's love for people, that's to say, and you will be my people, and to make it man-focused, and to, to look to humankind. And I think it's really interesting, because if, as I read the scriptures, you, not only is it both, but you can't have one without the other. You can't have a humankind that glorifies God unless God is a God who loves humankind. You can't have a blessing for God's people unless those people are giving glory to the God who gives the blessing. Like it just works. You can't have 
one without the other. And that's why we see these phrases tied together so often. I will be your God and you will be my people. I will take you to be my people and I will be your God. And I just love this because, again, it's all over the, the Old Testament. And it's carried into the New Testament. Where we think, well, who are God's people in the New Testament then? Because most of us sitting right here don't have Israelite blood. At least not much. I did my 23 and me. I got like 1%. But most of us don't have enough to call ourselves Jewish or to say we're an Israelite. So how do we say that we're the people of God? And it's because all throughout the Bible, not just in the New Testament, but all throughout the Bible, in fact, we're going to see it in about three weeks in the story of the Exodus, that when the people of God leave the promised land, actually a whole bunch of Egyptians come to believe that Yahweh is the supreme God, and they, go, they become Israelites. They go with Israel all the way to the promised land. God was, has always been a God about bringing people in to his kingdom. And isn't that what redemption is? It's taking somebody from outside the walls and bringing them in. It's taking the son who was outside and adopting them again, the one who was estranged, back into the household of God. And it's taking the Egyptian and bringing them into Israel. And it's taking the Gentile and bringing them into the people of God. And that's why the Apostle Paul can say, that all not, not all those who are by blood Israel are Israel. Not all are children of Abraham who are children of Abraham by blood. And so he brings people in. He redeems people. And that's the thrust of the book of Exodus. Is God redeeming a people and, and bringing them to himself. Taking them out of the land of the Egyptians and into his family. And it's about the eternal promise. That the promise that God made to Abraham in the book of Genesis. He made it again to Isaac. And he made it again to Jacob. And it became a promise for all the tribes of Israel and all the people of God until the time of Moses. And that as Moses rises up to be judge over Israel, to be the leader of Israel, the promise is reiterated to him. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And listen to this. He said, I will give it to you for a possession. But yes, God is gathering for, for himself a people to give him glory, to worship him. But in that, he gathers us so that the land would be our possession. That we have an eternal inheritance with God because of the promise that he's made. And he concludes this section, he says, I am Yahweh. And there's a really unique thing in the text because, and I'll leave this for small groups to talk about, but it wasn't until this conversation in chapter 6 that Yahweh revealed the divine name to his people. Before this, he was called El Yon, God Almighty. And even though the word Yahweh shows up in the book of Genesis, it's because when Moses wrote Genesis, he knew God's name, and he was plugging it in. But it wasn't until this event, when God is reestablishing his covenant with Abraham, with Moses, and with his people, that God revealed his personal name, his divine name, Yahweh. And he starts and ends this passage. I am Yahweh. I am Yahweh. It's a bookends the whole thing. So that Moses, in all of his discouragement, in every way that God has called him, he seems to maybe have failed, and yet God, God is reestablishing his promise. He's laying it on really thick here. That he wants to make sure that Moses does not walk away doubting the power of the Almighty. That he knows that Yahweh is indeed going to deliver his people. That he's going to make good on his promise. And so as we conclude here, I just want you to realize that 
you guys are coming out and you're worshiping, you're going to church and, 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 and hopefully you're praying and reading your Bibles throughout the week and, and most of you guys are going to small groups and you're doing all these things and sometimes they're largely inconvenient that you probably, if you're like other Americans, have a lot of things going on in your life and you could probably be spending your time doing other things and yet you're trying to keep your nose to the grind. You're trying to live a holy life and you're just trying to honor Jesus with what you're doing, with your time, with your resources and sometimes you feel like you're failing and as, and, and, and as you look to the future, you're not seeing it getting any better. And some of you guys are just there. Some of you guys are just there, that you're like, I don't know when I'm going to get out of this. And every time you hope, you you tend to hope, you say, well, well, when that check comes in, right? Tax season's coming up. Some of you guys are going to get a check. Some of you guys are going to write a check. Some of you guys are going to get a check, whoever you are. Some of those that are going to get a check, you might be hoping that. And you're thinking, man, as soon as I get there, we're going to pay off some of these bills. And then it's going to be, we're going to be set. We're going to be just fine from then on. And, And some of you guys are hoping in something else. You're hoping that, you know, when, uh, you know, when this kid gets a couple years older, this is going to get a lot better or something like that. And, and you're believing a lie that your circumstances are tied to your satisfaction. And the Israelites believed this lie. The reason that they wanted to stay in Egypt was not because they didn't want to be free from the pain that they were in. It's because they believed that the circumstance was tied to their satisfaction and the idea of leaving and going into the wilderness where life was going to be harder did not seem appealing to them. And that's why the Lord places his promise before Moses so that Moses would not get discouraged. And so that as Moses talks to the Israelites, that they would find hope. And this is why God lays his promise before you today. That look, sometimes life is great and sometimes life is really hard. But your satisfaction is not tied to your circumstances, whether good or bad. Your satisfaction is tied to the eternal promise of God that he has prepared a place for you. That there is a place where there is no more weeping. There is no more, there is no more pain. There is no more trial. There is no more sin and sinfulness. There is only the righteousness of God in every one of us. And that has been laid before us as the promise, the eternal kingdom of God. And that has been won for us by Jesus on the cross and in his ascension to the right hand of the Father. That is for you. That you would behold it. That it would give you hope. And like David prayed in Psalm 42, that you would not be satisfied by the pain of this life or the goodness of this life, but that you would be satisfied and your God, and your Redeemer, who is Jesus Christ. So on that thought, let me pray for you, that in your discouragement, that you can shift your mindset, or the rather better to say that the Spirit of God would shift your mindset, so that you could find satisfaction in Him. Let me pray. Lord, we come before you confessing that we have done this a million times over. We have put, we have placed our need for satisfaction in the circumstances of this world. Whatever, whatever it is that we think we want or need. But Lord, you are Yahweh, the Almighty, the creator of the universe. You are the one who brought all things into being, and you're the one who holds all things together by the word of your power. And, and, and it's in you to provide or to withhold. But Lord, we recognize that you have indeed provided for us, that as we find ourselves in a foreign land, in the land of Egypt, that you have indeed promised us a greater inheritance that you have that you have provided for us a possession that we will have forever lord that by your spirit we might behold that in such a way that we can walk in righteousness that we can walk in goodness and lord that we might find satisfaction in life in spite of any trouble that this life brings and that even when when there seems to be blessing in this life that we would always behold that as the gifts of our God and our King and our Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.